Today's speaker is Jeremy Coburn. Jeremy is a doctoral student at the Linguistics Department of Indiana University with a concentration on African languages and linguistics. His research interests include the documentation and description of languages in Tanzania. And recently, his work has focused on Hadza and the phonetics and phonology of Swahili. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy as he gives his talk, A Critical Evaluation of Hadza Language Use and Maintenance Efforts. All right, uh, thank you all for joining in and listening into my presentation today. Um, as stated, I will be talking about uh, some of the, uh, an evaluation that I um, have recently had, some observations I've recently had on a pre-dissertation -research, pre research trip that I made to the Hadza area, um, and we'll be talking about the Hadza language use at this time, and also the maintenance efforts that have happened and are currently ongoing uh, with relation to Hadza. So uh, the overview of my talk will be, first I'll give some background on, um, on Hadza, the Hadza people themselves, the Hadza society, um, the language in general, and then I will begin talking about the language vitality of Hadza, some of the observations that I've made, which are uh, a bit different than some of the earlier literatures, earlier observations of Hadza uh, language vitality. And we'll also discuss the current state of language documentation and maintenance efforts that um, exist with relation to Hadza, looking at what has happened in the past, what is currently ongoing, and the future of language documentation efforts. And then I will just wrap up briefly by talking about the Hadza language's future, um, what, what is in store based on the observations and, and efforts being made. Okay, so first, uh, beginning with a bit of a discussion about some, some location of where the Hadza live. Um, the Hadza people or Hadzabe, um, which you'll see probably used interchangeably throughout this, um, that's the designation that the Hadza call themselves in, in the Hadza language. Um, they occupy a region of north central Tanzania near Lake Eyasi. Um, so as you can see in this image, this is the Lake Eyasi right here. And the Hadza uh, occupy the, the region surrounding this area. Um, their modern range is approximately 3,000 square kilometers um, and includes four main areas. That's Mangola up in the uh, northeast, Sipunga and Tlika in the southeast, and Dunduhina on the west side of Lake Eyasi. Um, and the Hadzabe, they predate all other ethnic groups in the region. Um, they, that is to say that they are indigenous to the area which they currently occupy. Um, genetic and archaeological evidence have suggested that the Hadza have been here for as long as we could possibly track. Um, and probably for longer than any other uh, indigenous peoples have ever lived in the location that they are currently in. Um, DNA evidence ha have demonstrated that the Hadza DNA is as divergent from any other uh, human or any other indigenous or any other group um, in, in the world. That is to say that they uh, likely broke off from the human uh, tree very early on and have been living in this region for ten, probably tens of thousands of years. The, um, the Hadza society, current, the, the, the current population numbers, right around a thousand people um, living in 50 plus separate encampments. Um, this is based on some uh, data collected by Hill et al. 2014. Um, and the, of course, this number changes regularly as the camps move and uh, dissolve and, and also join together. Um, but this is the current uh, consensus on the, the population numbers. However, this is based on uh, heritage, that is, people who are ethnically Hadza people and not a linguistic um, data. It, so the number of speakers is likely less than that. Uh, native, the, the number of proficient speakers of Hadza is probably likely less than that. 
Um, approximately half of the Hadza are still full-time hunter-gatherers, living primarily off of tubers, as is pictured in this image, um, berries and hunted game. The other half are uh, having are living off of a mixture of hunting and gathering, as well as um, some income that they're generating through um, tourism and uh, also adopting uh, some of the agriculture and things like that. Um, high rates of intercommunication and travel between Hadza camps and areas is well attested. Um, anthropologists who have been tracking this, such as Brian Wood, have uh, demonstrated ha that, that the movement between camps is quite uh, high and that the people from the from different Hadza subregions, that is from Sipunga or Mangola, they're moving regularly, at least that is within the eastern side of Lake Easi. The, there, there's not any data that I'm aware of uh, of what's going on in the western regions in Dunduhina. Um, so it's possible that there's movement from there, but the, that I'm not sure of. Um, the Hadza society has no real hierarchical structure um, that is including gender stratification. So there is no um, you know, chief or person in charge. Uh, people are free to move from camp to camp at, at will as, how, as, as they please. Um, now that is changing a little bit, at least in my observations of some of the Hadza camps in the Mongola region, because when uh, um, tour guides are working with Hadza camps, they want a single person to work with. So the tour guides will select some, someone, some male from the group to be the person who they deal with, that they exchange money with, um, and as a, kind of a representative for the tour guide. So there, are, there is some inkling of a, a hier hierarchical structure uh, being created. In fact, many of the Hadza camps, the names they'll go by are by the, this person who has been selected. So you'll have Franco's camp, Franco being the person who um, deals with the tour guides. Um, society, Hadza society has been quite remarkably re resilient to change given the extensive time depth that they have been interacting with uh, people of other lifestyles, with pastoralists and agriculturalists. And in fact, there were many attempts to uh, to sedentarize Hadza peoples, especially early in, at, just after Tanzania's independence, during uh, underneath President Nyerere, there were many attempts to try to move them into uh, other locations and to and force them to start to take up agriculture. However, these attempts were largely unsuccessful. Most of the Hadza would would stay for a short time and then go back to their traditional lands and live the way that they had been before. Um, the social situation for the Hadza is a bit difficult uh, at present, at, at least specifically within the Mongola region. Um, some of those issues that they're facing is there's in, the encroachment of pastoralists and agriculturalists who are taking traditional Hadza land um, and by their activities driving out the game that the Hadza once depended, depended on for their subsistence and also using water sources which the Hadza once used in order to um, irrigate crops and for their own uh, water uses. Um, and this has been going on for quite some time but it has uh, sped up in recent, recent decades. The regional government officials are largely members of other ethnic groups. That is to say that they have no real representation in the local government. Um, however, in Mongola, there is a tourist office where a, a Hadza fund has been established that, that tourists who go to visit the Hadza must pay into in order to visit them. Um, and there are representatives from Hadza, native Hadza representatives within those offices to oversee the delegation of the, that income. Um, so there is some, but not, not to the scale that other ethnic groups in the region are having um, in terms of political involvement. 
the livestock and, and ag agriculture are, are seen as economically productive by the local government and, the, re and the, the federal government as well. Hunting and gathering is not. So preference, land preference has generally been given to uh, farmers and people trying to come in um, looking to use the land for economically viable purposes. However, the Hadzabe um, do actually contribute to the econ economy quite substantially in their own right. Um, and that's going to be what uh, largely what we're talking about today. And that is through their uh, ability to draw high numbers of tourists to their camps um, and, and by so doing bringing in uh, economic gain for the region. So they are contributing in their own right. And this has actually been uh, a, a reason for why they've been able to secure some land rights as, as it is. Um, one issue with that though, is that the Hadza ethno tourism or ethnic tourism is largely not controlled by the Hadzabe themselves, but by external tour guides. So they're not uh, free to decide how things are run. They basically are told how it's run by the guides uh, and the tour companies. And so the guides in this way have a very strong uh, power differential over the Hadza who they are visiting. The Hadza's issues right now um, dealing with the loss of land is also the loss of the game animals, which means that the traditional Hadza diet is less sustainable. Um, historically, they used to hunt large game and um, would gain a, a large portion of their diet from that. Uh, however, today, all of the large game has been moved to game reserves or driven out by pastoralist and agriculturalist competition for um, food in the AAC region. And so because of that, they're no longer able to hunt in most areas, large game. However, there are some still in uh, Endamaga where they're able to get some large game. Um, but for the most part, they're depending on small game, which are still plentiful, um, such as hyrax or birds or um, baboons, things like that. But they lack the nutritional value that they, the larger game had. Um, and so they are, are it's affecting them in terms of their health and, and their growth. Um, the food sources that they do still have, such as baobab fruit and other, uh, other gathering activities, those are now being collected also by some of the other ethnic groups um, who are now collecting those baobab fruit and, and using it to sell or to eat or whatever it may be. And the uh, animals that the pastoralists are driving and, and the farmers uh, keep also are eating a lot of the vegetation which would be used to hide some of the small game that the Hadza would be hunting and also some of the tubers and things like that that would be collected by the Hadza for their food sources. So um, another very large issue with that is that the agricultural practices, um, specifically onion farming in uh, the Mangola region are depleting water sources, which the Hadza would use for water, but also which would be used by the animals that the Hadza would hunt. Um, are, they're, they're being depleted by the agricultural uh, practices being used, and it's also depleting their food sources. One specifically that is an issue is that the pesticides being used in the onion farms are killing the bees that the Hadza once used to collect honey and have been doing for quite some time. Um, so that's an issue that the Hadza are very aware of. They will say, you know, we, we used to collect large skins full of honeycomb and now we're lucky if we get any. Um, and so because of this, the Hadza diet has been uh, significantly reduced, especially in its nutritional value. And so they've been forced to rely more heavily on tourism as a source of income in order to supplement their, their diet um, in order to be able to afford to buy meat that they can't get otherwise or um, starting to use maize flour, things like that. So now let's turn to the Hadza language itself, give a, back, a bit of background on the language. Um, despite, so talking about its classification, despite the initial groupings by uh, many authors, such as many researchers such as Greenberg in 1963 and many more um, who originally grouped Hadza among the Khoisan languages, for obvious reasons, it being one of only a few languages in the world that, you, that uses clicks. 
Um, Hadza is now widely accepted to be a language isolate, and this has been strongly uh, contested for in works such as Sands 1995 and Sands 1998, um, among many others. So originally, the grouping the, it was believed that starting with Proto-Khoisan, that the Sandawe and the Hadza branched off quite early on, and then the Southern African Khoisan languages branched off later. That is now, however, not generally believed to be true, especially for Hadza, um, which has been shown to be unrelated to any other language. Looking at the sound inventory, um, as I said, this is one of only three languages outside of Southern Africa to use click consonants. Um, the others being Sandawe, which Helen Eaton presented on a few weeks ago. Um, and the other being Dahalo, which has borrowed clicks, is a Cushitic language, I believe, which has borrowed clicks. Um, Hadza also has clicks. It has three click types, that is the dental, alveolar, and lateral click, with four click accompaniments, um, asp an aspirated series, the tenuous unaspirated series, a na nasalized clicks, and glottalized clicks, as seen at the top of this chart. Um, it also has aspiration contrast in plosives and affricates, including in the prenasalized series. So you get prenasalized aspirated stops, as well as with the affricates, tsa and cha. Um, you also have a series of ejective affricates uh, displayed here. The v v vocalic system is a five vowel system that is a, a, e, o, u. Um, the, some of the phonetic data that was analyzed by Sands, Madison, and Latifoged in 1996 um, should have shown that the vowels, the vowels are much more um, centralized than the cardinal vowels, but they are the a, a, e, o, u. Um, and there is report of vowel length distinctions and vowel nasalization. However, the exact workings of this have not been um, extensively studied and so they're not included here. Um, some examples of some of the click, uh, words containing clicks are examples such as eta, to be happy, ama, again, and mobako, uh, baobab. So Hadza grammar, um, turning now, is uh, the word order itself is rather flexible. The default has been analyzed as being BSO. However, most other, uh, most other word orders have been attested to some to, to varying degrees. The exact workings of why this is has not been, um, has not been researched extensively. And so this, that's as far as we uh, are able to say at this point. Um, nouns are marked for two genders, that is masculine and feminine, and, and also marked for number with suffixes. So in the previous slide, we see ngobako, the ko suffix here is marking the feminine, and the masculine is unmarked on nouns. Um, it is a fusional language, um, and is mar it marks, it's, the subject is marked by enclitics, which may be on the uh, main verb or may be moved to the front on a, an auxiliary verb or an adverbial. Um, so may, may be marked on other places other than the main verb. However, the object is marked with a suffix on the main verb. So the level of endangerment currently has been stated by UNESCO's Atlas of World's Languages and Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger as being vulnerable. That is to say that most children speak the language, but it may be restricted to certain domains, such as the home. Um, Ethnologue has listed it as being threatened, that is used for face-to-face -face communication within all generations, but it is losing users. The reality of the situation, it, it's complicated. Um, well, these two, um, Classifications are true in the sense that it is true that most children do speak the language currently. Um, it, it also says it is restricted to certain domains such as the home. One of the issues with this classification with regard to the Hadza is the domains to which it is used are really the dom only domains that most Hadza are living in. That is, they're staying mostly within the Hadza speaking community. 
they're not dealing in general business, other, other domains. Um, and so in that sense, it could be seen to be more, ha have, have a higher vitality uh, because of that. However, um, as I will talk about in a few minutes, there are some worrying changes that are occurring currently, at least within the Mongolia region, which may mean that, uh, that the outlook is, is more dire than has been previously described. So looking at what, what is causing the linguistic stability or instability for that, for that matter um, with regard to the Hadza is first, obviously, the, mo the, the massive land loss. Um, the, the, the Hadza are losing what has been traditionally their uh, homeland. And because of that, they're becoming more dispersed and there is less, um, less easy movement between areas such as the Dunduhina Hadza, which are much more um, isolated than the other Hadza. Um, there are no local school, very few local schools for the Hadza to go to. So because of that, the Hadza generally must go to a boarding school if they want, if they're going to school. Um, they're not really able to live within a camp and then travel to school. That, and so because of that, there are certain implications which come from that, which I'll discuss in a minute. Um, there is high levels of multilingualism. There likely has been for quite some time, but that's increasing, especially as Swahili is taking a stronger hold. Um, but there's also many Hadza which are uh, bilingual in Datoga, in Isanzu, in Sukuma, etc. Um, and so they're, they're, this may be having an effect. How much effect, we don't currently know. Um, that's left to work that will be hopefully pursued in the near future. Um, but there, there is definitely some uh, influence coming from other languages. And this is seen in Hadza itself, which has a lot of borrowings from these neighboring languages. Um, so this is not a new occurrence. The ethnotourism is affecting the, the language in ways that I'll discuss in just a moment. Um, there is pretty heavy social marginalization. The Hadza have been historically um, and are currently looked down upon by many of the societies which surround them. They are seen as being backwards, um, unsophisticated, uh, an embarrassment to a developing country, um, that they don't speak a real language. This is a common sentiment that they don't speak a real language because of its use of cliques. Um, I know as I spent some time in Arusha and I would tell people in Arusha region that I had been working with the Hadza, they had all sorts of stories such as um, all those people, they're cannibals or, or things such as that. So there is a lot of stigma around the Hadza uh, within Tanzania and within the region. Um, there is also a lot of inter-ethnic tension. The Hadza are very much on, in Mongolia at least, again, most of this I'm talking about is based on my uh, impressions within the Mongolia area, which is where I had visited. Um, there is a lot of inter-ethnic tension. There is fighting between ethnic groups. Um, Hadza feel like, the Hadzabe feel like other groups are out to get them, that they're attacking them. There's reports of fighting and um, even deaths occurring because of this. So that's an issue. Um, and then there's also a lot of loss of just the traditional ways and knowledge um, that's, uh, that's occurring because of some of the uh, modernization that's occurring within Tanzania as a whole. So looking at the current Hadza land use, if, if you look at this map here, um, talking about the restriction or the, the, the loss of land that the Hadza are, are encountering, it, the pink region outlines where the Hadza likely were uh, dominant uh, up till the late 1950s, so fairly recently. Um, however, today, if you look here, the, the areas in dark green are protected lands that the Hadza now own. These are the only areas that the Hadza have any ownership over and has been a very recent development. Um, and I'll talk more about where those come from in a moment. The lighter green regions up here in Mongola, these are lands which are used by the Hadza, but with agreement um, between them and the Datoga who are using this for grazing land. Um, the other tan areas are grazing land used by pastoralists and the brown is the farmland that is expanding rather rapidly into Hadza territory, um, which is, is a significant issue. 
So one of the issues uh, facing the Hadza language at this time, one that I observed uh, quite readily during my stay there, was the, the, the issue of language commodification. Um, so language commodification is something that's been talked about, uh, especially a lot recently in, in sociolinguistics or in anthropological linguistics um, as um, where language becomes a commodity that then becomes sellable, something that is sold to tourists in a way that um, generates income. Within the Hadza context, tour guides are actually demanding, and this is again, anecdotal evidence given to me by the Hadza themselves, that the tour guides have been demanding um, for the Hadza to one, be, make sure that they're wearing their traditional, traditional and even some less traditional, but uh, odd looking uh, clothing uh, whenever the tourists are around in order to maintain a what has been described as a, a sense of tourist realism that is creating a, um, a commodity of the culture for tourists to then partake of. Um, and also this is, is, has included the language. So the Hadza language, because of its clicks, um, is something that is interesting to tourists. And so the tour guides will tell the Hadza, when the tourists are here, use more clicks. And as a, as a consequence of this, many of the Hadza speakers in the Hadza, in the Mongola area, um, are starting to change words to include more clicks. Um, so, for example, I have this example here, Mtana, which is the, the most common greeting in Hadza, um, which can be translated loosely as, how are you? People are now, Hadza speakers are now pronouncing this as Mtana with an alveolar click instead of an alveolar stop in order to include more clicks in their conversation, including the, the, the tour guides themselves will greet Hadza people with this, this modified greeting, Mtana. Um, and there's also uh, anecdotal evidence to suggest that uh, the Hadza, when, when, when tourists are around, will, will, will select their lexical items based on in increased use of clicks. Um, and some will even um, basically say nonsensical things in order to make their language sound like it has more clicks than it actually does, all at the request of the guides who are, who are um, demanding this in order to increase tourist interests. Um, the, another influence that is happening on the language is the influence of Swahili. Um, now, again, this has, is not an empirical study that I've, uh, uh, that has, I've undergone um, that will hopefully be done in the future. However, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that Swahili language and culture is influencing as can be seen in this image. Um, these, this picture was taken probably 10 minutes after tourists left a camp. Um, 10 minutes prior to this, everyone here was dressed in baboon skins and carrying bows and arrows, um, and, and including the, the young men who have straightened their hair. They made sure to cover those with baboon skin hats. And then as soon as the tourists left, they switched into what would be considered more, more Swahili influenced uh, attire and began playing card games, speaking in mostly Swahili though with a mixture of Hadza as well. Um, and this was a, current, a common occurrence that I witnessed while I was there. So now looking to the, the language maintenance efforts that have been in the past that are currently ongoing and which will uh, hopefully be continuing into the future. Um, this is just kind of an overview of some of the efforts that have been made and I'll talk more specifically on several of these points. Um, that is first the, the need for language rights activism, um, which has been done by the Dorobo Fund and the Ujama Community Resource Team. Um, this has been absolutely imperative for the, the Hadza to maintain there is at least some of their land, and I'll talk more to that in just a moment. Um, there has also been, in the past, creation of Hadza literature for external use. Um, so, for example, Hadza Stories and Songs, 1998 by Guru Bala um, and Bonnie Sands. This is a, a collection of Hadza stories and songs and um, tales that have been collected, transcribed, and translated 
and produced a book, which is now for sale at uh, a, the, the tourism office in Mongola for uh, tourists to be able to buy and, and be able to look at. Uh, another uh, very important, uh, very interesting book was created by Dowdy Peterson, um, who is the operator of the Dorobo Fund. And uh, so the book Hadzabe by the Light of a Million Fires 2013 is a collection of um, Hadza's stories and, and um, descript eth ethnographic descriptions, um, descriptions of uh, their um, hunting styles, their tool usage, um, etc. This is all collected within Hadzabe by the Light of a Million Fires and it is available in English and in Swahili and again sold at the tourism office there um, in Mongola. Um, other language uh, documentation efforts that have been made are in, include some audiovisual recordings. For example, UCLA, the UCLA Phonetics Lab archive has recordings that were made by Bonnie Sands, Ian Madison, and Peter Latifoged um, and are still available on the UCLA Phonetics Lab archive website. Um, other, another audio recording, which is a recent development, is um, recordings made and housed on hadzabebible.com, which is um, a retelling of Bible stories and the New Testament um, as translated by uh, several speakers, uh, native Hadza speakers in Mongola area um, and produced um, by an, individ an interested individual. Um, and there's also a collection of songs on there as well. Uh, there's other, presumably other archives scattered across the world. We've come across these from time to time um, and we'll probably continue to find some. There are storytelling videos created by Richard Griscom um, with Gudo Bala. And there are also numerous fe feature length documentaries made um, about the Hadza that are available on uh, many different types of sites, such as Amazon, uh, Prime Video, uh, Netflix, etc. There is also a myriad of anthropological and ethnographic literature, including uh, works by um, Philip or by um, by Marlowe and Brian Woods and uh, many other anthrop anthropologists who have done a lot of uh, quite extensive work with the Hadza. Um, and there is also some linguistic literature, however much more is needed. So looking now at the land rights activism, kind of going through details of these specific uh, co components of the language maintenance efforts. Um, the Dorobo Fund is a, 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 an organization um, located in Tanzania um, and uh, operated by the Peterson brothers, um, Dowdy and his brothers, who Dowdy being the one who wrote the, the book Hadzabe by the Light of a Million Fires. Um, and it aims to secure um, the, the, and to protect the cultures and peoples of Tanzania, um, especially the hunter gatherers and other people of the Rift Valley region. They do this through um, kind of their executive arm, which is the Udyama Community Resource Cent Team, UCRT. Um, and UCRT's purpose is to uh, secure land rights, support education, advocate for um, at-risk uh, uh, communities such as the Hadza, um, fight for women's rights and leadership forums, uh, and, and also to help secure um, not just the land in terms of ownership, but also in terms of biodiversity, um, et cetera, to help maintain the areas for the indigenous populations um, to continue to maintain their desired lifestyles. Um, so going back to that map that I had shown about the Hadza land uh, ownership and usage, the, the land here marked in green is the ones is the land owned by the Hadza. These were uh, negotiated for and advocated for by Dorobo and UCRT um, in order to secure them because uh, the Hadza were losing their land quite rapidly and nothing was being done. 
in order to curtail, to curtail that uh, the encroachment by the agriculturalist and pastoralist. But thanks to some of these land rights activist teams, um, the Hadza have been able to obtain some of their own land and, ha and have rights to that land, ownership of the land. And this is a continue. It is an ongoing um, process and and project that they are uh, pursuing. Looking again to the Hadza literature, um, as I said, the Hadza stories and songs, and also Hadza Abe by the Light of a Million Fires are all available for purchase, um, both at in Mongola as well as online. Um, the Hadza Bible, HadzaBeBible.com repository is quite an interesting one because this was the first recordings created and intended solely for the Hadza community. Um, the idea here was that uh, by the individual who, who, who did this project um, was creating these translations and then disseminating them using micro SD cards in these solar powered radios as pictured here. Um, and were given to Hadza in various regions in order for them to be able to listen to the Bible in, their, in, in the Hadza language. Um, however, the reports on this uh, um, from those involved have been that there was a general disinterest in the recordings. Um, what often happened was the Hadza would sell these, um, these radios to make extra money. They'd sell the SD cards or they'd overwrite the SD cards um, to put other things on them, songs and things on them. Um, and so there was kind of a general disinterest in it, but however, it is interesting because HadzabeBible.com is an online repository, which is open access, freely available to, um, to look at as, as, as pictured here, um, where there is hundreds of, uh, recordings of varying length, some up to 15 minutes long, um, where there is, uh, Hadza recordings of, Hadza, of Bible stories in Hadza, um, translations, uh, discussions, and uh, religious songs as well. And these are all available for download. Um, moving now to the work that, the, the, so the assistance that, that the Rift Valley Network actually has in this as, as it started, um, is that it, it enables us as researchers who are interested in Hadza to connect and um, collaborate on issues that are facing not just Hadza, but other languages in the region, because a lot of these things are not unique to the Hadza. Um, and so the Rift Valley Network assists in uh, forming a, a media for a medium for that collaboration in um, assisting in the language maintenance efforts. So looking now at the, some of the necessary actions that uh, I anticipate will be needed in the future in order to help the Hadza um, maintain the language and their culture is first, obviously, the securing of land rights. The land that they now own is much smaller than the land which they once owned, and the land they're given is often the least productive of the land um, preferences given to the farmers for the land that is more um, agriculturally productive. Um, so much, much more needs to be done in order to secure land rights. This will protect, protect the Hadza's lifestyle and their right to self-determine what they would like to do um, and how they would like to live their lives. Um, this is, is very important and, and will also help in the maintenance of their language. Um, a lot more work is needed in language documentation of Hadza, such as the creation of a grammar, which it currently lacks. Um, there is several possible orthographies which have been proposed. However, literacy efforts, literacy is very low um, and the, there is no generally accepted orthography by, by everyone, including among researchers. Um, and so these things may be able to help in the future in, including literacy efforts, um, if that's something that the HUDs are interested in. There is a need for internal and external activism, um, including encouragement within the community, helping them see the importance of their language and, and how they can maintain it. Um, the necessity for educating surrounding ethnic groups, especially those who are 
in political power and have the ability to make a difference. Um, and then collaboration between researchers, institutions, and governments in order to uh, be able to assist in this effort. And to maintain, uh, to maintain the domains of use. Um, one issue that is occurring with, in terms of the Swahili, effective Swahili language and culture on the Hadza is that um, many of the children who are now, who, who went to school, who are now reaching the age of childbearing, um, they, they attended school in uh, where they used only Swahili. And based on my observations during my recent trip there last summer, um, there are children within traditional Hadza camps who are now preferring to use, young children who are now preferring to use Swahili when speaking with their parents and even with their elders um, over Hadza, which is um, not something that has been very widely attested in the past, um, this preference for Swahili. But it's because the young parents are becoming much more comfortable with Swahili as a language and much more comfortable and, and desiring to enter the greater Swahili culture within Tanzania. And so this is leading to some effect on the language vitality, as I said, um, which is an issue. So upcoming projects that will hopefully, uh, that will help in expanding the documentation of Hadza include a project by, that is funded by ELDP um, that will be done by Andrew Harvey starting this year, um, later this year, entitled Gorwa Hadza and Isanzu Grammatical Inquiries in the Tanzanian Rift Valley Area, where Andrew will be um, working on these three languages and in increasing their level of documentation, as well as looking at um, specific grammatical structures, which are indicative of the Tanzania Rift Valley Area, um, Sprachbund, and looking at trying to look at those specifically in these three languages and um, connected to that project is a, a project that will also be funded by ELDP that will be done by Richard Griscom um, to start later this year which is entitled Documenting Hadza Language Contact and Variation. Um, Richard will be focusing on um, working with Hadza speakers in the four main the four sub uh, Hadza subregions that is Sipunga, Tika, uh, Mongola, and Dunduhina to train language so native uh, Hadza speakers to do language documentation themselves and will by so doing increase the level of documentation and well he will also be looking for language contact and variation between these regions which has largely been unexplored at this point um, and so it will be a significant contribution to what we know about Hadza and the, the sociolinguistics, the sociolinguistic picture currently existing between the, the four areas. <coughs> Excuse me. The future maintenance work that I, my, I myself am undertaking is for my doctoral dissertation, I'll be working on a Hadza grammar. Um, I'm currently in the stages of securing funding for that. Um, and that is to add to our knowledge of the grammatical structures, which have been described in the past by researchers such as Bonnie Sands um, and Kirk Miller. Um, but I, I, I hope to be able to add to that by creating, uh, for the first time, a, re a reference grammar for Hadza. Um, other works that, efforts that can be made that have been asked for by the community themselves is um, for children bo children's books. Um, they would like to see books in their language that are available for their children to read, especially as they'll start to be learning to read in schools and things like that. Um, however, the issue with that is that there does need to be a creation of a standard orthography, which is generally accepted within the community, um, and obviously subsequent literacy efforts to teach that orthography to the community. Um, there is the need for continued land rights activism, as I said, um, at this time, language education is not necessary in, in and of itself, but one thing that could possibly be beneficial is the creation of a Hadza schooling system. This is something that has been done in places such as Australia, where schools were brought to um, nomadic hunter-gatherers in order to combat the necessity for, build, for sending children to boarding school, um, which would then secure the intergenerational transmission of culture and language 
Um, however, there are no current uh, projects in the work to do this, but it is something that may be of interest in the future. Um, the methodological issues related to Hadza deal with the great distances between the areas, um, the regional government's awareness of the interest of tourists and researchers. So there is um, a lot of oversight and uh, necessary fees that must be paid in order to work with the Hadza. Um, and also the lack of hierarchical structure can mean that dealing with, you have to deal with everyone at an individual basis. There's no general um, structure that you can, uh, or, or group that you can uh, approach in order to do that. Um, and so this is some of the issues that will have to be faced as the, the, the process of documenting Hadza continues forward. So looking at Hadza's future, um, this is based on my own impressions, but realistically the Hadza language and society is at a critical point right now. As I said, the young children are starting to move more than ever before towards the use of Swahili. Um, that means that this is a very critical point for us to be able to um, help combat some of that language shift that, that may occur. Um, the, intergener the intergenerational transmission is still occurring, but is increasingly under threat of, of shifting towards Swahili as in many other societies in Tanzania have. Um, as I said, the young parents are in, in many ways um, involved in this shift because they are preferring to speak in Swahili to their children as they are also preferring to speak in Swahili to one another. Um, <coughs> and so as a result, children are moving towards Swahili. Um, without immediate action, there is a possibility for a rapid decline in the language's vitality. Um, fortunately, there are efforts being made. There are efforts that are in the works and hopefully ones that will continue to be done in the near future. Thank you very much for listening and I will take any questions now. All right, thank you, Jeremy, for this presentation. Um, as you said, I think we can now begin the question and answer section. Uh, let's see, I, I think we I have a question of my own that I could start with. Um, so uh, I think it's quite common that in endangered language communities uh, that are geographically dispersed, we see some differences, like some geographical differences in terms of language use or language vitality. So, um, for example, it's been reported that in Dunduhina in the West, most of the Hadza no longer speak the Hadza language. Um, whereas I, I have heard, I think uh, Kirk Miller wrote that in Mangola for, for a long time, um, Hadza was kind of somewhat more isolated from other language communities and was kind of to some extent uh, preserved more than in some other areas. But I guess um, in, the, in the case of Nunduhina, I'm, I'm curious if you could just speculate. I mean, I, I don't expect that, you know, that we have an answer to this, but why in Nunduhina would Hadza disappear, and this is outside of the, the tourist context, uh, whereas in other areas it would, uh, it would be maintained? Right, right, that is a, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know a lot about the Dunduhina area in terms of how much interaction the Hadza have had with the surrounding peoples. I know that based on reports, as you've said, um, <coughs> excuse me, they have been moving towards Sukuma specifically. Um, and I'm not sure what the social context is over there. Um, I do know that in the Mangola area that, that the Hadza have been more isolated, as you said, from the surrounding ethnic groups. However, now that that's changing because tourists, for tourists, Mongol is the easiest to access. Um, and so that's why we're seeing some change there now. Um, but in terms of why, historically speaking, the Hadza in Mongola have been more resilient to change or to loss of you know, language shift as opposed to Dunduhina, I'm not positive. Um, my own speculation would be that because the, Dundu, the, the Dunduhina Hadzabe are more isolated from the rest of the Hadzabe, they, there has been a smaller community and so language shift was easier to change within a small community rather than in a larger community which had um, high levels of transiency between them as reported by anthropologists such as Brian Wood. Um, and so that may have assisted in securing a stronger sense of their Hadza-ness 
um, as opposed to those who are more isolated on the other side of Lake Eyasi. Okay, thanks. And I had kind of one comment to add to this. I know you um, mentioned this uh, to me um, uh, just in, a, in our personal uh, communications that uh, another reason that the situation in Mamola is really interesting um, in terms of uh, language vitality uh, is because many uh, many Hatsa speakers from other areas have now been traveling to Mongolia to kind of participate in the uh, tourism economy. And so some of those shifts that we see are not just affecting those who have traditionally resided in Mongolia, but might actually be affecting speakers who might have been residing in other regions previously. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I appreciate you reminding me of that. Um, what it is something I wanted to mention um, that so reports are that people from um, the, the, the southern parts of Hadza land, um, from Sipunga and Tika, from Yayadachini, have been migrating to Mongola because of the opportunities that tourism is giving them, um, specifically the youth. Uh, there was several camps that I visited that were almost exclusively young adults um, living with, with no um, elderly people. And the, they had come there because of the opportunities that, that financial, you know, monetary gain could, that they could, could garner from, um, from the tourism industry. Um, so that is very interesting uh, looking at that in terms of the, the sociolinguistic um, issues that, that come from there. Um, the other reason is because of um, tourism, camps are becoming much more sedentary than they ever have before. So one camp that I visited, I asked how long they had been in that area and they had been there for two years um, in the same spot, which is very rare. Um, and that was done because it was easily accessed from the road by tourists. And if they move continuously, then it's harder for the, the tour guides to be able to find them. And so they've, they've preferred to stay longer in certain areas. Um, and then they just move between those established camps based on uh, specific times of year, things like that. Right, great, thank you. And uh, we have a question now from Andrew Harvey. So um, Andrew writes that uh, one of your prime goals is developing a reference grammar. So what would be the biggest contribution of a documentation project to your work um, on that reference grammar? How, how would how that look like? And there's some clarification. Oh, how would the ideal contribution from a documentation project um, in relation to your descriptive based project look? And just to provide some context here, I think Andrew is saying the documentation work that, that he and I are planning to do in the future how, uh, how could that work best service uh, your goal of creating a reference grammar? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I think Andrew is actually probably the most well-equipped person to address that, that question because in his own descriptions of um, Gorwa, he um, has done extensive work in documenting the language and also um, very interesting archival work where you can connect uh, directly via uh, some numerical system. I don't know exactly how his system works, but some numerical system where you can you can reference specific references within a, a, a linguistic description of the language to specific recordings in a documentation project. Um, and so something as, as like what you guys are doing um, for your, your, your upcoming project is um, the accessibility of that uh, documentation work in order for me to be able to you know, scrawl for specific linguistic structures that I may be interested in or looking at or phonological environments or things like that um, will allow me to have additional data from which I can um, pull into my own grammatical description of the language. Um, so in, in that way, it, it's actually extremely beneficial for collaboration between the two uh, projects. All right, great, thanks. Um, let's see, I don't think I see any other questions. Um, so I, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page. And entries for each presentation are uh, added to the Rift Valley bibliography. 
Uh, also, looking ahead, the next presentation in the webinar series will take place on Wednesday, September 4th. The talk is titled Southern Nilotic and Personal Constructions from a Typological Perspective, and, uh, and I will be giving that talk myself. <coughs> and then uh, following that, we will have a presentation on Wednesday, September 18th by Martin Maus, titled The Iraq Imperfective and Its Challenges to Morphology. All right, and I think uh, that is uh, everything for our presentation today. So I'd like to thank Jeremy Coburn again for his presentation and also everyone else for partic participating today. And uh, we hope to see you again at our next webinar. <laughs>